Leaked audio details a leftist smear to paint all conservatives as racist. Andrew Scheer appoints a former liberal to be his number two. The NDP in Alberta are caught lying about conservatives. Plus, the CBC wins this week's fake news award, and we're introducing a new segment, Ask Me Anything. I'm Candace Malcolm, and this is The Candace Malcolm Show. Hi everyone, thank you for tuning in. We have a lot to get to today, so let's get right to it. There was a story that came out in the CBC this week about Warren Kinsella, who runs a consulting group called Daisy. And this article really details just how bad the scheme was for basically the Conservative Party of Canada, Andrew Scheer or someone in his office, organized and paid this consulting group to paint and smear leader of the uh, People's Party of Canada, Maxime Bernier as a racist. So this story came out the last couple of days of the election. It kind of derailed the media attention. Everyone was talking about it. And the details were pretty sorted. This is the kind of thing that just drives you crazy as a conservative. Warren Kinsella is a well-known liberal strategist. He worked for uh, John Critchen. That was sort of his claim to fame. And he doesn't, he's not a big fan of Justin Trudeau, to say the least. And so the details of this came out. Maxime Bernier was rightly upset. The whole thing to me just struck me as like too cute. You know, like the conservatives didn't really need to do this. They could have run against Maxime Bernier and beat him just by, you know, having better policies, having better ideas and showing better leadership. Instead, they concocted this backroom deal, which Canadians just hate. And don't get me wrong, I'm sure that all the political parties do this. I, I'm certain that if, you know, journalists were out there digging in the same way, they'd find out that the Liberals had a similar scheme, a similar plan to discredit uh, Jagmeet Singh and the NDP. This kind of stuff does happen. It's dirty, but it's politics. Well, this new CBC report paints the extent of how bad it was. Audio uh, recordings have been leaked, and so we can actually hear Warren Kinsella sort of drumming up uh, his troops and, and, and calling on them to basically what they were doing was opposition research, digging into Maxime Bernier and trying to find any examples of him being racist, not just to paint Bernier as racist, but to paint his supporters and again, to paint many, many conservatives. And uh, they quote Warren Kinsella as saying, we actually have a white supremacist trying to become prime minister of Canada. I've run campaigns depicting Preston Manning, Stockwell Day, Kim Campbell, depicting them as racists. None of them were, but I was su successful at depicting them as racists. This guy actually is a racist, okay? So it's low hanging fruit. Okay, there's just so many things that are wrong with this. First of all, uh, th there's no reason to believe that Maxime Bernier is actually a white supremacist. He has a pretty mild criticism of immigration and that was really drummed up by the media. Uh, he, his problem was with multiculturalism and I think that that's a legitimate area of concern. It's something conservatives have long criticized the official state policy of multiculturalism. That is where the government says that Canada has no culture, but we promote all cultures. And, that, and that, that's very problematic as opposed to what I like to, to call pluralism, where Canada has its core culture and newcomers come, they have to kind of adapt to the core culture of Canada. And then on top of that, they can maintain their own sort of cultural and religious uh, traditions and whatnot. Uh, so, so official multiculturalism should be fair game to cr criticize in Canada. But because Maxime Bernier went after that, the media painted him as racist and white supremacist. I don't think he is. I haven't seen evidence saying that he actually is those things. But Warren Kinsella seems pretty convinced that he is. And then this is the worst part. He, he brags, he boasts that he successfully depicted uh, these three conservatives as being racist. Uh, all conservatives in Canada uh, should absolutely just be outraged over this because the CBC is reporting it as if it's scandalous. CBC was part of the reason why those campaigns in the past were successful. C CBC, if, if they're now saying, you know, the reason that these people were de depicted as racist is because of this one liberal strategist who runs these intentional smear campaigns, well, then they should retract all those other stories from decades and decades painting conservatives racist. It's so harmful. It's so unfair that conservatives who just might have, you know, regular criticisms about immigration and about public policy get smeared this way. Shame on the CBC. And again, if the conservatives were working with this kind of, uh, with this organization, they all deny it. Just, just to put that out there, they deny it, but uh, these recordings, again, are pretty uh, damning, showing the details of that. So 
not a great uh, story for the conservatives and Andrew Scheer. And things over in Scheer's campaign, again, they're just not going very well. Media are really, really piling on. You know, if you just scan the headlines this morning, you know, what you're really seeing is a growing number of people within the conservative ranks kind of turning their backs. There's a new uh, nonprofit campaign to remove uh, Andrew Scheer's leader that's run by Jeff Ballingall, who's a person in charge of Ontario Proud. So it's a big grassroots organization. And if the person who's leading that campaign is turning his back on Scheer, not good for Scheer, not good for conservative unity. Uh, Lisa Raitz come out uh, saying that she didn't think Andrew Scheer was strong enough. And then I, I just don't understand this one. Andrew Scheer has appointed Toronto area MP Leona Alislev as his deputy leader. So basically his number two. Now, Leona is not really a household name, but she originally ran and was elected as a liberal under Justin Trudeau. So just back in 2015, she was against Stephen Harper, against the conservatives. She was recruited to run as a liberal under Justin Trudeau's banner. And after, you know, a, a little while in his caucus, she was disillusioned and crossed the floor. She was able to win back her seat this time as a conservative, but th that's not very deep roots to the conservative party. Just four years ago, she was bashing Stephen Harper and bashing the conservative brand. So I really don't quite understand why Andrew Scheer would look to somebody who has just, you know, very, very short history with the party to say he's number two. He said that this is the kind of pe person that we need to recruit into our fold. That's fine. In order for the conservatives to win, they do need to recruit uh, the sort of suburban moms and women, uh, the swing voters that can go liberal or conservative. But that doesn't mean that your number two in your party is going to be someone who just four years ago was a liberal. So it's tough to defend uh, Andrew Scheer when he does stuff like that. Okay, let's move on. This this is a, a pretty funny story. So this week's slow clap goes to the NDP out in Alberta. This story just cracked me up. So basically earlier this week, the NDP put out a press release uh, drawing attention to what they said was a bulk purchase of alcohol by the Conservative Party, by the United Conservative Party out in Alberta. Okay, in a news release, the NDP caucus claimed that Alberta's Ministry of Culture Multiculturalism and Status of Women purchased $35,000 worth of alcohol from Prestige Liquor. The NDP said the company is owned by a prominent conservative donor and financial supporter of Jason Kenney's leadership campaign. Okay, so they put out, the NDP put out this press release uh, basically just saying that um, there, it's like a quid pro quo that they're buying alcohol from this wealthy donor um, through taxpayers' dollars, and then this wealthy donor is donating back to Jason Kenney. This contract reeks of corruption, it says, <laughs> but this is according to the CBC. Hours later, the NDP caucus acknowledged it was off the mark because nearly $4,000 of the liquor was bought by the NDP government before it was ousted in the spring election. Oh, okay. Goes on. The U UCP government has since spent more than $31,000 with Prestige. In a statement to CBC News, a government spokesperson said the liquor was purchased for resale at the Royal Alberta Museum restaurant. The restaurant recovers 100% of the cost, so there's no net cost to the taxpayer. The NDP apologized to the liquor business on Facebook. The NDP official opposition wants to formally apologize to Prestige Liquor, it said. The process of purchasing liquor from them did begin one month prior to the spring election. No record of transactions with the business appear in the Blue Book for financial year ending in March 31, 2019. However, the government had produced a February 2019 invoice for $3,920. Ouch. So next time you go after an opposition party for spending, make sure that it wasn't actually your own government that was doing the spending. And this is just the icing on the cake. Jason Kenney um, tweeted he went over to Prestige Liquor and he bought his uh, holiday alcohol stash. Uh, from Prestige Liquor, to, uh, put out a tweet, need to restock my bar for the holiday season, so I stopped by Prestige Liquor, a great Edmonton small business. I heard about today to buy some quality Alberta spirits. Great selection, price and open late. Thank goodness Ralph Klein privatized Alberta's liquor stores. Okay, that, that's just too funny not to include. And let's do this week's Fake News of the Week award. Not surprisingly, it is going to the CBC. So this story popped up. He's not the guy, a Quebec Tory candidate, on why he thinks Andrew Scheer must go. So here's a story. The CBC interviewed this individual. 
uh, Mikhail Mikhail, who says that the conservative leader was dragging us down constantly in his writing. Okay, so you think, wow, this is a pretty interesting story. The CBC has interviewed a candidate who lost um, and who ran under Andrew Scheer. The only problem is that you realize that this individual candidate ran in the riding of Riviere de Mille-Ile, which is a suburb of Montreal. And surprise, surprise, the riding has never gone conservative. It was created in 1997. It has never gone conservative. The individual who was interviewed here, he finished fourth. He got less than 10% of the votes. He was not a realistic candidate. He, he, he had basically no shot of winning. The Conservatives never win in this riding. So why is the CBC interviewing this individual? He says that the reason that he lost was because of Andrew Scheer. The question was, you believe it was Scheer who dragged you down? He said, oh, absolutely. But really, if you look at this riding, th th there's so many other interesting stories that the, that the CBC could have told about this riding. So it was a liberal riding, in the last election, it was a, a liberal MP who got defeated by the bloc. Uh, the liberals fell by 4% in the last election, and they only lost this riding by about 2,000 votes. So why didn't the CBC interview the liberal MP to ask why she lost? Why didn't they find out, you know, was it Justin Trudeau? Was it his leadership that made them lose this particular seat? Uh, you know, the bloc kind of came out of nowhere. NDP used to hold this seat back in 2011. At that point, they gained... They won with 50% of the vote. This time around, they only had 8% of the vote. That could have been another interesting story for the CBC to tell from this writing. But instead, they picked the fourth place guy to talk about why he thinks he lost. Well, let, let me just tell you, the reason he lost is because he's a conservative. If the guy actually wanted to be an MP in this writing, he should have run for the Liberals or the Bloc or maybe the NDP who are all competitive. This is not a conservative area. This is not a conservative stronghold. And so the idea that maybe the conservatives could have won if it wasn't for Andrew Scheer is just nonsense. I'm pointing this out on Twitter. It would literally be the equivalent of the CBC going to Lethbridge or going to Red Deer or going to some very, very strong, strongly held conservative riding in Alberta and interviewing the liberal to find out why they think they lost and for them to just say, oh, it's of course because of the current leader. If it was not for the current leader, for sure, we would have had a shot at winning. Just total nonsense. Again, the CBC, they're out looking for hit pieces. Anyone who has an axe to grind with leader Andrew Scheer will get a huge platform at the CBC as long as you're willing to bash them, as long as you're willing to bash Andrew Scheer. Again, this is why you just can't trust the CBC. They're not objective. They're not. They don't actually try to tell interesting stories to Canadians. They're out looking for hit pieces against conservatives and right now against Andrew Scheer. All right. Now, this is a new segment that we're excited to introduce. It's Ask Me Anything, Ask Candace Anything. The questions are reserved to people who are club members for True North. So if you're interested in putting a question forward and having it read on the show, go over to tnc.news, sign up for one of our clubs. And once you're a club member, you get the privilege of asking me a question and I will answer them on air. So let's get right to it. The first question here is from Kaylee. She says, one, are the RCMP still investigating Justin Trudeau, really SNC-Lavalin? I haven't heard anything about it. And then she also asks if we're planning on doing a show about the gun ban that the Liberals are proposing. Well, this is an interesting question. And again, I feel like the answer is not clear. Once again, Canadians are so often kept in the dark, especially anything to do with the RCMP, anything to do with investigations. So at this point, it isn't clear. We don't actually know whether SNC is being investigated, whether the Liberals are being investigated uh, for the deal that they were given. And we do know that before the election, they were looking into it. And then they said that they were putting it on hold because of the election. So they didn't want to be actively investigating during an election, which doesn't really make sense. They shouldn't they shouldn't stop their police duties just because there is an election. And we haven't really heard anything else. So we're going to continue to try to get questions from the RCMP. But again, we've seen this time and time again in Canada, whenever, whether it's a terrorist attack or something like an investigation, we just don't really know what's going on because they're not transparent and they don't keep people up to date on what's going on. And then as far as your question about the liberal ban, yes, my colleague Andrew Lawton is a legal gun owner. He knows a lot more about guns than I do, admittedly. And he has been following this story. I know we have 
have a story up at tnc.news right now on Bill Blair, a study that he commissioned through his old department before the election. We know that they're looking into it. We know it was part of Trudeau's campaign promise, really concerning that they would go after legal gun owners in this country when it's pretty clear that the crime, the gun crime in this country is very much connected to illegal guns. Um, so I'll, I'll refer over to my colleague Andrew Lawton for that because he's much better on the issue than I am. Our next question comes from Elaine. What exactly is assistant PM? Has there ever been one before? How much power does this position hold? Thank you, Elaine. Okay, Elaine, I think you're referring to the new deputy prime minister position that uh, Justin Trudeau has appointed to Christia Freeland. And let me just tell you, deputy prime minister position is an honorary position. In other words, it's totally made up. It's ceremonial. They don't have any official power. They get the same title as the prime minister, the honorary, or I guess as the as a minister. So the honorary is, is a title. And again, the position's made up. It was actually invented by Justin Trudeau's father, Pierre Elliott Trudeau, in 1977, largely to recognize the long years of service um, to his own friend uh, who he appointed. Now, interestingly, when you go through history and look at, you know, over the last 40 years, who has been deputy prime minister, you see that it's largely liberals and that conservatives don't really acknowledge the position. Joe Clark never had a deputy prime minister. Mulroney did, but Stephen Harper did not. And now the Liberals have brought it back under Christia Freeland. So the, the position doesn't really hold any power. Just like Trudeau completely invented the new ministry of middle class prosperity, he's also invented this really just to give someone a soft landing, no real duties, um, but probably filling in for a lot of the stuff that Trudeau himself just doesn't want to do, as we've seen uh, already. He sent Christia Freeland out to Alberta to meet with Jason Kenney, probably because Trudeau himself didn't want to meet with Kenney. And uh, I think we'll be seeing a lot more of that, just Christia Freeland getting sent to do stuff that the Prime Minister should do, but he doesn't really feel like it. He wants to take a personal day, he wants to take vacation, and so he's sending his deputy instead. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. This one comes from Rob. My question is regarding immigration. We're always told how wonderful immigration is and how much it benefits our country, which I agree with to a point. Are there any statistics that outline the benefits prior to Pierre Trudeau's 1978 changing of our constitution and adopting, without Canadians' approval, official multiculturalism and thus our immigration policies versus after this change? I believe that would paint a vastly different picture than what the left is trying to force down our throats. Thank you, Rob. All right, Rob, thank you so much for this question. You know, this is a really interesting question, one that I'm personally very interested in. I know that Martin Collicott, the late Martin Collicott, former ambassador, a Canadian ambassador, he sadly passed away two summers ago. He used to write extensively on this. He was a columnist over at the Vancouver Sun. He was involved with the Fraser Institute. And this was one of the things that he would study when I went back to look at if there's anything recent, all the stuff that I found on this topic was put out a decade ago, put out even longer. Uh, interesting study by the Fraser Institute, the effects of mass immigration on Canadian living standards and society. That was edited by Herb Grubel. And I, I will tell you that there is just really a lack of this kind of reporting in Canada at the moment. This is one of the reasons originally why I started the True North Initiative, which was to focus on immigration and studying the kind of issues around immigration, because I feel like over the last 10, 15 years, uh, topics that we used to be able to discuss, topics that require discussing in a free society, in a free democratic society, there's just a hush around it. And again, it goes back to the story that I was talking about off the top that conservatives get accused of being racist for really nothing. And same with this, people people were accusing Martin Collicott of being racist. All he was doing was looking to empirically study immigration to see which kind of policies work and which kind of policies don't. In a free and democratic society, we should be able to look objectively at policies and criticize them regardless of what those policies are and that is part of the problem so again I think that this kind of thing is greatly needed in Canada I think if, if you're interested in finding out more details on those kind of changes uh, you should check out this Fraser Institute study because it does mention that look at Martin Collicott and some of the things that he has written over the years uh, with both the Vancouver Sun and I think his stuff would also appear in the Ottawa Citizen. And of course, check out True North. Uh, that's one of the things that we do is we keep up to date on immigration and national security issues and we do 
who deep dives into these issues. So I'm going to leave it at that. We'll get to the rest of the mail questions. Ask me anything next week. And if you are a club member and you want to ask a question, go ahead and email that over to us. So allude to that. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great weekend.